Hello and welcome to this short preview video in the hopes of preparing newer readers for book 18 of Emily Wilson's translation of The Odyssey, a book she entitles Two Beggars. Uh, as I said, actually to my classes today, they are uh, just finishing book 12. Uh, guys, uh, the folks that I teach, uh, one guy was uh, asking as class began, if the goal of this whole poem was for Odysseus to get back home, and he's back home in the beginning of book 13, how is this book, how is this entire epic going to function? How are we going to, how are we going to have half of the epic happen after the goal is achieved? Which actually led to a pretty interesting conversation that I wasn't planning, but we ended up having, and the, you know, the students made a bunch of predictions, some of which were pretty accurate and some of which weren't, but it doesn't really matter is the fact that they were thinking about it. So I just want to say that uh, when you learn about epic literature, whether it's um, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, Beowulf, Paradise Lost, usually one of the things you're, you read is that the significant characters, the, the, the main characters are gods, generals, war heroes. And that's true, right? But Homer is way ahead of his time in that he has marginalized characters who end up being really important. And I've mentioned this before, but the nurse Eurycli is important. Uh, Eumaeus, the swineherd, is important, and even the villains, who are you know beggars, are important. So this is a book that Emily Wilson entitles Two Beggars," and it's just again part of the process for Odysseus to he he's returned home geographically, but he has to also be home in terms of his actual identity. So I'm just going to reduce this introduction, limit it to just four key moments in book 18 to, to think about. So the first is the first few pages. And what you learn in the first stanza of book 18 in the Wilson translation is there's a man who they call Iris in line five or so, who is the lowest of the low, right? He's a, he's a, he's a beggar. And all of a sudden, uh, Odysseus, in disguise as a beggar, is sort of intruding on his territory. And in the second stanza, line nine, Iris says, get away, old man, to Odysseus, or else you'll be dragged out by the foot. Do you not see the suitors winking to tell me I must throw you out? This is embarrassing for me. I must make, make you get up to fight right now. And Odysseus has a really interesting level multi-level response and in the next stands around line 14 he says fool i did not do you wrong or speak against you i'm not jealous of another beggar odysseus it seems like he doesn't have to feel diplomatic when he's talking to a beggar right because he's a beggar and he could speak as equals um he then says in line 18 a really important line i i put an asterisk next to this doorway can accommodate us both. In other words, the rules of Xenia um, don't really suggest that there's one beggar allowed per kingdom. But what an interesting line. Do not hog all the wealth, it's not yours. And then he says, you seem to be a homeless man like me. Um, gods give all mortal blessings. Do not stir me to fight or lose my temper. I'm old, but I will crack your ribs and smash your face to a bloody pulp. Okay. Then I will have a day of peace tomorrow. You will not return here to the palace of Odysseus. And again, pay attention to all the dramatic ironies. I mean, Odysseus is in disguise, constantly saying things about Odysseus. Penelope is there, not realizing her husband's present, constantly saying things about Odysseus. So they end up um, sort of pushing each other around, kind of like middle school or like a fight in a middle school recess. And Antinous says in line 42 to his buddies, quick, let's goad them on. Antinous is looking at these two guys, these two lower class guys, as just, you know, two beggars fighting is like a sport. It's like a joke. Even if one kills the other one, it doesn't really matter. And Antinous offers them a reward, goat stomach stuffed with fat and blood. Okay, that's the special on the menu that day in Ithaca, I guess. And... um What's what's really interesting is Odysseus takes off his rags, wraps them around his waist, and suddenly uh, the problem 
is that Odysseus's muscularity shows his big shoulders, his thick legs, and he he just destroys Iris, um, breaks his jaw. There's blood everywhere. People laugh. Um, kind of reminds me of the scene in Beowulf, which you might read when you have a British literature class. It's one of the only, if not the only, instance of laughter in Anglo-Saxon poetry, where um, one of Hrothgar's men is laughed at by Beowulf. It's weird. Not a lot of laughing in epic poetry, so I would mark it when it happens. And uh, so Odysseus wins definitively. And then on the bottom of page 412, line 122, so I would again just kind of mark up your book as we go in these little introductions, right? It'll kind of ground you when you listen to the thing. Amphidamus, one of the suitors, says, Sir, this is after Odysseus wins, be our guest and may your future luck be good, though now you have so many troubles, right? Because he's a beggar. Listen to Odysseus's response. You have to, this next big paragraph, I just like bracketed the whole thing. Odysseus replied, his wits about him. The implication being what? That sometimes his wits are not about him. That's a separate conversation. Here's what he says. Amphidamus, you seem intelligent, like Nisus of Dilichium, your father. I heard about his wealth and excellence and that you are his son. You're well spoken. Take note of what I say. And Odysseus, again, he's not talking to a beggar now, so he has to be he has to be diplomatic and careful, but watch what he says. Of all the creatures that live and breathe and creep on earth, we humans are the weakest. When the gods bestow on us good fortune and our legs are spry and limber, we think that that nothing can ever go wrong, right, when you're young. But when the gods bring misery and pain, we have to bear our suffering with calm. Our mood depends on what Zeus sends each day. And then he gets weirdly close to truth here in light of the fact that he's in disguise. I once had what most people count as wealth, great riches. I committed many crimes of violence, abuses of my power. Think of that. I committed many crimes of violence. I don't, what I wonder is, does Odysseus think he's making up a story or does Odysseus actually realize that he's absolutely telling the truth? Odysseus himself, not in disguise, the real Odysseus, has absolutely committed many crimes of violence. Uh, abetted by my brothers and my father. No one should turn away from what is right. A man should quietly accept whatever the gods may give, which Odysseus, by the way, never does. I see how wickedly the suitors are behaving, wasting wealth and failing to respect the wife of one who soon will come back to his family and homeland. Right? I put D-I, dramatic irony there. Very soon, may spirits guide you home so you do not meet him. When he comes, then he's talking about himself, right? When he confronts the suitors in this hall, there will be blood. And then uh, that's kind of the end of the main, of that main scene. So there's this little play within the play here. And by that, I mean, we're watching the suitors watch the Iris and Odysseus fight and interaction. So that's just a really weird set of moments. I did not analyze them fully at all. I just scratched the surface. So I think that's worth writing and thinking about. Secondly, um, and we've already sort of discussed this, is the, the speech to the suitor Amphinimus, uh, that long speech I gave that I, just, that I just read. So you have the initial fight with the beggar, and then you have this speech that's full of truth. And I wrote the question in the margin, and maybe you want to too. This is the margin of page 4, 413. Is this Odysseus's truest speech yet? Which would be something since he's in disguise, right? Um, try to find something here that's not true, right? I committed many crimes of violence. No one should turn away from what is right. The whole thing about the gods, the whole thing about when Odysseus returns there'll be blood. It's really, it's a really interesting moment to give a completely truthful speech. Then um, we get Penelope struggles. Let's not forget her. Um, there's all this tension and my freshmen read uh, Romeo and Juliet and I make always make the point, and a lot of them notice that once uh, 
Lord Capulet forces Juliet to marry Paris, the man she doesn't want to marry. And suddenly he says, you have to marry him on Thursday in a couple of days. That propels the action quickly forward. So that's a way for Shakespeare to get to the climax and to end the play. Um, suddenly there's this new stranger home. Suddenly the suitors are asking for her hand in marriage sooner rather than later. And Penelope says the speech of a middle-aged woman, right? She says that on line 181, the gods destroyed my beauty that day. My husband left in hollow ships. I'm not, I'm not not beautiful because I'm older now. My beauty has been taken away by the sadness of missing my husband, which is really interesting. And curiously, Athena herself hears this. And in the next stanza on page 415, again, mark this up, line 188. Athena's eyes were bright with plans. She poured sweet sleep onto Penelope, who lay, do lay down on her couch. Her joints relaxed. She slept. Athena gave Penelope gifts of godlike power to make the men astonished when they saw her. Okay, circle the word power. It's not what you think. It's a 3,000-year-old poem, and we have our preconceived notions of gender and why women are appealing, and obviously she's the queen and has land and money. But he says here that to make Penelope appealing to the suitors, Athena gives her the gift of power. So absolutely worth talking about. So Athena's, uh, Penelope's allowed to rest. And then it says later in that paragraph, she also made Penelope shapelier, taller her skin more beautiful. So Athena does this. She does this with Odysseus at times. She does this with, with Penelope here. And of course, in line 211, the predictable happens. Penelope shows up in front of the suitors, and it says in line 211, the suitors weakened at the knees, desire bewitched them, and they longed to lie with her. And then... Uh, she says to Telemachus on the next page, page 416, Telemachus, you're not thinking straight. Uh, and then she goes on and she worries that in her house, a beggar, who she doesn't realize is Odysseus, a beggar has been so insulted, right? And that's, you know, when, when things happen in your home and you're the head of your home, it's your responsibility. So in line 220, underline this. What happened that you allowed a guest to be insulted? If strangers in our house are so abused, what then? You'll be ashamed. Your reputation will be destroyed. Think of, think of like our national circumstance now. Think about maybe your town. Think about the extent to which your family and friends welcome strangers. If strangers in our house are so abused, what then? Oh, it's such a great line. So uh, Telemachus admits uh, in line 228, I cannot even afford to think my own heart's thoughts. The suitors are distracting me. And, you know, so Penelope gives this really important speech. It's, it's on page 417, line 249. Listen to what Penelope says to her son, who's around 20. No, the deathless gods destroyed my looks that day. The Greeks embarked for Troy. And my own husband, Odysseus, went with them. If he came and started taking care of me again, I would regain my good name and my beauty. I am weighed down by grief. A spirit set so many troubles on me. At the time that he left Ithaca, my husband, gra listen to this. This is a backstory, but it goes on and on. It goes to line 271. Pay really close. We haven't heard this. This is intimate information. She finally trusts Telemachus is sort of maturity, right? Parents start talking about their lives with their children at a certain age. This, this is happening here, right? She says to Telemachus, um, he, before he left, uh, he grabbed my wrist, took my hand, and said to me, this is line 259. This, she's quoting Odysseus. Now, wife, I do not think we armored Greeks will all come home unharmed from Troy. And, and we know based on the whole poem so far that no one, whether you survived or not, no one's unharmed. And also we know that only Odysseus has survived. She continues Odysseus's story. Odysseus tells her before he leaves, 
They say the Trojans are good warriors with arrows and javelins, and they ride chariots drawn by swift horses, which can quickly turn the tide of war in which so many die. Some god may bring me home, or I may be captured out there in Troy. I do not know. This is Odysseus's farewell to his wife 20 years ago. You must remember this. My parents need to be well cared for in our house. As much as now or more so with me gone away, when our son's beard has grown, you must get married to any man you choose and leave your house. So that's imagine having to say that to you, to the love of your life with whom you just had your first child. You're going off to war and you see the bigger picture. You say, if I don't make it back, continue with your life, create a stable home. So Penelope tells, tells him this. Um, so she's going through struggles. And I just want to point out, we have, you know, the struggle, whether it's Odysseus or Penelope or Telemachus, we have this layered struggle where we have a struggle in each, in each of their hearts that sometimes they voice and sometimes they don't. We have a struggle between them and other characters, whether it's, whether it's with the suitors, with other beggars. So we have conflict between people. But we also have the fact that this is a nation state. This is, this is a, a community unto itself that's all screwed up. Okay. Then we have, um, we have Athena who, as I said earlier, makes Penelope beautiful and strong. And if you go to line 346, um, we have this. It's in the middle of page 420. Athena wanted pain to sink down deep inside Odysseus. She made the suitors keep taunting him. I mean, it's it's almost, you know, it's abusive, not that a goddess cares, but she is making Odysseus so angry, so abused, that when the right time comes to fight back, we can only imagine what that's going to look like. So this is uh, homework or just something to reflect about. Think about one of the moments, whether it's the fight, whether it's Penelope's struggles, Telemachus' struggles, Odysseus' speech. Quoting the text at least once, maybe reflect in a paragraph about why you think this passage is important in this chapter. What words stand out to you? And what do you think? It's a really good thing to speculate. Where do you think this moment, this, this moment in book 18 you've thought of, will lead to in the following books of the poem? Okay, I hope this helps with your reading and good luck with book 18.